is one campaign which marks 40 years since 10 Baha'i women were hanged in Shiraz, Iran, and honors the broader struggle for gender equity in that country. Why I bring this especially to your attention is the photo of the youngest victim, the one in the pink shirt, Mona Mahmoudnezad, whose short life and commitment to human rights has been an inspiration to Professor Akaban most of his life. But tonight, he will speak on the initiative of small island states to hold major polluters accountable for global warming. These are islands that face threats to their very existence. And they are all looking for change in this. Good evening. Uh, it's a great honor to be able to share some thoughts with you this evening. And I, I'm very grateful to the Baha'i community of Ottawa for inviting me to this beautiful center. Uh, and I'm uh, also grateful to all of those who are joining us on this thing we call Zoom, um, which has made things much easier for a lot of people. Um, I'm going to share with you tonight some thoughts on this cold evening about global warming. And although I'm a human rights lawyer, I have recently become entangled in what I think is arguably the most pressing challenge, or at least one of the most pressing challenges of our time, which is climate change, and I thought I would share with you um, a, a recent case that I've been involved in, first case before an international tribunal, addressing climate change from the perspective of international law. So I thought I would share with you what inspired me to pursue this case and to share with you a PowerPoint presentation, which will give you some sense of the journey that brought us to this historic hearing in September before the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, which is a bit peculiar, and I will explain why this tribunal in fact plays such a central role. Um, although I'm a lawyer, I like to think I'm a good lawyer, yeah. not the ambulance yeah. chaser, although I end up dealing with a lot of very depressing things in my life. And <laughs> I'm not going to tell you lawyer jokes, except the following. <laughs> I'm a lawyer, does it take to change a light bulb? Three, one to go up the ladder, the other one to push him off, and the third one to sue the ladder. <laughs> but I've also been an academic. So I can even tell you that it takes even more That's academics true. to change the light bulb. Mm -hmm. It takes 10, one to go in and screw in the light bulb, and nine to criticize his methodology. <laughs> So that's it for lawyer jokes and academic jokes. We're now going to get into the substantive part of this evening. So I was brought up um, in a Baha'i household in Tehran and mm -hmm. came to Canada when I was nine years of age. And I have now become a proud Canadian citizen. And as our um, uh, uh, host was speaking about the story of Mona Mahmoud Najad, that was for me a very uh, profound formative experience when at 16 years of age, um, as an immigrant youth trying to fit into Canadian society, committing all sorts of heinous fashion crimes. <laughs> I'm incredibly grateful there was no Facebook in those days. I would have <laughs> recorded some of what I wore because it would have instantly destroyed my career forever. Um, so uh, in my sort of uh, world of um, uh, an adolescence, uh, I had to contend with the fact that uh, someone my own age from the same community had been arrested, uh, put in prison, subjected to uh, torture merely for demanding our human rights, for speaking truth to power in, an high school, in a high school essay. And when Mona was executed in the summer of 1983, so 40 years ago, this July, um, that was a very uh, profound moment where I had to ask myself the basic question of why her and not me? And that was the beginning of my journey in search of a better world, in search of justice, uh, which brought me to the field of international law. But it wasn't just the uh, tragic execution of Mona and many other loved ones that inspire this journey, but it was also the very basic teachings of the Baha'i faith about the oneness of humankind. And this is really the central teaching of the Baha'i faith, not merely that uh, the unification of all peoples in a world civilization 
is um, a desirable state of affairs, but that it is the destiny of humankind. And there is a very big difference between imagining something which certainly in my circles, sophisticated academics and UN bureaucrats and diplomats would be ridiculed as a completely naive idea, given the mess that the world is in today. But the Baha'i perspective is that uh, we are in the process of witnessing the end of a turbulent adolescence and the coming of age of humankind, and that all the forces of history are irresistibly uh, uh, propelling humankind towards unification in a single planetary civilization, which is inextricably uh, interdependent. And because of that inextricable interdependence, which is a reality, it is a reality, an inescapable reality, rather than some lofty aspiration, then we must also have global institutions that uh, allow us to solve the problems, in particular problems such as climate change, which I will speak about today. And one cannot imagine something as quintessentially global as climate change to make us understand that all of the boundaries that we have created in our minds are entirely irrelevant. When you look at the world of nature, when you look at uh, the climate system, uh, ecosystems, you begin to see the world in a very different light. And in fact, I'm an international lawyer, so I see the world through all of these boundaries because the basis for the current international legal order is that the world is structured in terms of some 200 sovereign states. There is no world legislature. There is no world court with compulsory jurisdiction, um, which is one of the issues I will speak about today. The whole edifice of the international legal order is the principle of state consent. Sovereign states have to consent to be bound by norms and also consent to be bound by the jurisdiction of international courts and tribunals. And of course, you can begin to see that if we want to move towards a world which is not based on uh, anarchy, a world where uh, might does not make rights, where justice prevails, where there is an international rule of law, you need institutions um, which, when all uh, other means have failed, peaceful negotiations have failed, that states would have recourse to adjudication as a last resort. And in fact, the idea of adjudication was one of the first experiments in international institution building. You may have heard about the Hague Peace Conference of 1899, which at the end of the uh, highly destructive uh, Napoleonic Wars was convened in The Hague, the capital of the Netherlands, um, at which there was an attempt by some idealists to outlaw warfare that would not come to pass. Mm -hmm. But uh, two things did happen in 1899. One was the adoption of a Hague Convention on Land Warfare, which today we call uh, the laws of war or humanitarian law, uh, an issue that would be very much at the forefront of our minds as we see the conflict today in the Middle East, in Ukraine, and many other places around the world. But in respect of peace, although states did not agree to outlaw warfare, which was the continuation of foreign policy by other means, as von Clausewitz famously said, they did agree to establish the permanent court of arbitration which would not be a standing court, but an arbitral institution where the parties would appoint arbitrators in order to settle their differences. So the Peace Palace, which is, any of you who've been to The Hague um, would know that there's this beautiful building called the Peace Palace, which is the seat of the International Court of Justice, was initially built to house the Permanent Court of Arbitration. And the building was completed in 1913, just one year before the First World War. And the First World War, of course, was unprecedented in its um, destruction and, and, and the number of uh, civilian uh, uh, deaths. And, and uh, that gave rise to the League of Nations, which was the first attempt at creating a global institution. The League of Nations failed. 
And uh, by 1939, we had a yet more catastrophic war, the Second World War, at the end of which the UN Charter was adopted. Um, the UN Charter prohibits the use of force except in self-defense. It declares that human rights are uh, universal. It creates structures such as the General Assembly, the Security Council, and the International Court of Justice as the pillars of global governance. However, 75 years later, we see that the United Nations is inadequate, inadequate that the extent of globalization interdependence, the nature of the problems that have brought once distant nations together is such that we need far more robust institutions. And I would argue that in addition to human rights and trade and all the other aspects of the interrelation uh, that bind nations together, climate change is the game changer. And it is the game changer not only because nature does not respect all of these artificial boundaries that we've created, but because nature's laws are more important than any laws that we may conjure in our imagination. And for the first time in history, uh, because of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, since the Industrial Revolution, in fact, we have reached a point where we could suffer catastrophic consequences unless we dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions, phase out fossil fuels. Um, and I know we have uh, people in the room who are much more uh, uh, educated about the, 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 the policy and technological and other aspects of the problem. But suffice it to say that climate change is a matter of our common survival. And it most powerfully exposes the fact that we are one human race <laughs> inhabiting one common home. Either we all survive together or we perish together. So what is the science behind climate change? Well, one of the points is that because of greenhouse gas emissions, there has been a steady rise in global temperatures which is why in October you have 30 degree uh, heat in Ottawa or Toronto or, or, or what have you, uh, increased uh, forest fires, uh, flooding, sea level rise, which is a very big issue, as I will explain, for small island states. But the point is that scientists have told us, and we will examine some of the institutions through which the problem of climate change has been addressed, they tell us, that in order to avoid the most catastrophic consequences of climate change, we must limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels by the year 2100. So we are 70, uh, uh, I'm sorry, yes, yeah, 70 odd years away from that point in history where we must limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. But if you look at the what are called the nationally determined contributions, NDCs of states under this Paris Agreement, which was concluded in 2015, a grossly inadequate instrument for addressing climate change based essentially on non-binding, vague, unilateral commitments without any means of enforcement. If you combine the nationally determined contributions of all states, then you will see that we are now set to hit 2.8 degrees Celsius instead of 1.5 degrees. So twice the maximum temperature rise beyond which there will be catastrophic consequences. So I don't mean to be alarmist, but it is not too far-fetched to say that if we continue on this trajectory, we will face civilizational collapse, mass extinction, otherwise we'll be fine. <laughs> so you begin to see why this is such a fundamental challenge. And it's a fundamental challenge at many levels. On the one hand, we have to think in global terms because there is not a single source of pollution. We have, of course, major polluters. China and the United States, between the two of them, produce about 45% of greenhouse gas emissions. 
But at the end of the day, there has to be a burden sharing all nations based on their levels of development, based on their historic contributions to greenhouse gas uh, emissions, uh, have to assume their share of the burden, have to radically mitigate, radically mitigate um, uh, carbon emissions, phase out fossil fuels. We probably need, even at net zero, we're told that the uh, significant part of the ice cap of the Antarctic, even at net zero, will melt and potentially result in a five meter rise in sea levels, which would be absolutely catastrophic. So in addition to uh, radical uh, uh, emissions, uh, cuts in emissions, a shift to green energy, we probably have to have a global uh, uh, organization that would invest hundreds of billions of dollars in carbon capture technology, stratospheric aerial spraying and all sorts of other things that scientists are not thinking about. But the bottom line is this requires a unified global leadership in the name of our uh, common survival. And just one last thought before uh, speaking about this particular uh, case and giving it a wider context, there is also a cultural dimension to this challenge beyond the issue of global governance and international law and so on and so forth. One of the basic uh, questions which has arisen now is our way of life, consumer capitalism, a materialistic civilization, which has defined progress and the pursuit of happiness in terms of um, material consumption. Um, so in a sense, we have to redefine the idea of progress. There's the degrowth movement some of you will know about. And we have to start calculating, even from an economic point of view, the cost to the environment of persisting with this level of pollution, this level of consumption. So while it is disturbing to think about catastrophic climate change, it is also an incredibly exciting and unprecedented opportunity to reimagine the world. And perhaps that's why, as a Baha'i international lawyer, I also see this as an opportunity to uh, radically reimagine the world and put humankind in a different uh, trajectory. So getting to the question of climate change and small island states, I'm going to share with you just very quickly a set of slides that I made for my law students. So forgive me if there are some legal texts, I'll go through them very quickly. I don't understand what they mean anyways. So. Um, one of the reasons why this case was begun is because in what is called the Conference of Parties, COP, you may have heard about COP, in 1992, um, there was the so-called Rio Earth Summit in Brazil. And um, five years earlier, 1987, uh, a certain Dr. Hansen and NASA scientists for the first time testified before the US Congress about climate change, the idea hadn't really taken root uh, prior to that. So by 1992, at this Rio Earth Summit, um, the uh, UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change was adopted in order to create a framework for addressing climate change. But once again, it was structured based on state consent. It was very loose, it, it gave states very wide latitude to decide what they will or will not do. And the sad reality is that almost 30 years later, with annual conferences of parties, um, there was one last year in Sharm al-Sheikh in Egypt, the year before that in Glasgow. And these are huge conferences. And Glasgow, where I attended, there were 30,000 people there. You have heads of state and government, you have civil society activists, you have indigenous peoples. It's quite quite a gathering of very diverse peoples having very different conversations. And one gets the sense that governments are not taking seriously how urgently and radically they need to change in order to uh, avert uh, catastrophe. So the small island states, as I will explain, are the canary in the coal mine of climate catastrophe. Because when you're a small island like Tuvalu, which on average is less than two meters above sea level, well, 
you can do the math. If you look at uh, the thermal expansion of water through heat, water expands. If you look at the melting of the Antarctic and Arctic uh, uh, ice caps, um, and if you look at the intensification of storm surges as a result of uh, uh, more and more extreme weather events, you realize that some of these islands are going to become uninhabitable. They will literally disappear under the water in the foreseeable future. So these islands, ironically, which are the smallest nations on Earth, Tuvalu has a population of 10,000. So these islands, which are at the absolute margin of the power realities of the world, they have no economic clout, no military strength, nothing except their voices, have ironically become global leaders in um, basically ringing the alarm bell and saying, what is happening to us today is going to happen to the rest of humankind tomorrow. So it's a remarkable exercise in planetary politics, as I'd like to call it. And they decided at COP26 in Glasgow, as I will explain now, that they are going to now turn towards international courts and international law to change the conversation away from these vague unilateral commitments, which are unenforceable, to binding norms of international law based on the idea that international law already prohibits the conduct which is somehow seen as permissible under the Paris Agreement, the basic principle of transboundary harm. You cannot allow your territory to be used in a way that causes harm to others. So with that introduction, I will begin my uh, International Environmental Law 101 <laughs> class. And I apologize once again if some of the slides are not suitable for this kind of, of a, a lecture. So this is where I could be right now, but I'm happy to be with you in Ottawa. Typical uh, small islands, and there are about 40 small island states, and they are concentrated largely in the Caribbean and the South Pacific. So in 1990, the small islands created AOSIS, the Alliance of Small Island States, around the time when uh, there was increasing consciousness about the effects of global warming. And they, of course, were at the forefront. They already were feeling the effects of uh, more intense storm surges, rising sea levels, salination of freshwater sources, and a whole host of other problems. So by the time the UN Framework Convention was adopted in 1992, the small island states had already formed their own alliance to address these issues. This is the UN Framework uh, Convention, 1992. And all I need to tell you here is that there was an agreement on the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. The basic principle being uh, one of sustainable development, that you cannot ask countries that are poor, uh, that are still developing, that have made negligible contributions to greenhouse gas emissions, to forego their development while the developed countries um, continue their uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So there is a kind of idea of climate justice or equity. How do you distribute this burden uh, across the world so that those who have made the biggest contributions uh, also make the biggest cuts? Because right now, it's those who have made the most negligible contributions that are paying the highest uh, cost. So here is the Paris Agreement of uh, 2015, which was adopted under the UN Framework Convention. And as I said earlier, the Paris Agreement provides that it is desirable to keep temperature rise to within 1.5 degrees, but it doesn't contain any hard obligations except some procedural obligations that you should every year declare what your nationally determined contributions are going to be. And there's no means of enforcement. And you can see why the major polluters in particular don't want to tie their hands. They want to be able to focus on their own uh, economic growth and development. And whether you're a democratic society who has to answer to voters or even an authoritarian system, 
which has to increase the standard of living of people, um, protection of the environment sadly generally comes in a distant second to uh, the idea of economic growth, except now we have to redefine what economic growth means because catastrophic climate change has an economic cost as we're beginning to understand. Um, so here is a principle which I wanted to just share with you briefly. There was in 1941 an arbitral award between Canada and the United States. It's called the Trail Smelter case. And in British Columbia, in the town of Trail, there was a smelter which was spewing noxious fumes from its chimney, which was going into Washington state in the United States, and it was creating great environmental harm to farms and forests. So there was an arbitration in which the principle was established of transboundary harm, that you cannot, although you're as a sovereign state, you can do as you please on your territory, you cannot allow activities that cause harm to your neighbor. And of course, there is a difference between noxious fumes going across the border and greenhouse gas emissions, um, but in principle, they are the same. Perhaps the chain of cause and effect is not as clear, but the problem remains that if you are knowingly failing to curtail your greenhouse gas emissions, knowing that it's causing catastrophic harm to climate vulnerable states, then the principle applies. And the principle is called the polluter pays. You pollute, you pay. And I remember saying this to one of the prime ministers of the small island states who I will show you shortly. And he looked at me and says, I like that, <laughs> polluter pays. And to him, it is something that he used in his speech at COP26 because the idea is, well, let's just negotiate. Let's just keep on negotiating. Let's not talk about law. Let's not talk about legal responsibility. This is not useful. This is a problem that's complex. And it is true. You cannot litigate climate change out of existence. But at some stage, the small island state said, we've had enough. Because after 30 years, no one is taking this problem seriously. We're going to go under the sea. So we are going to turn to international law and try to put some teeth into the global regime. So here you have the flag of, who knows? Vanuatu, Vanuatu in the South Pacific. And Vanuatu, um, in September of 2021, declared its intention to lead a campaign at the United Nations General Assembly to request an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice that I've just discussed previously. An advisory opinion is not adversarial litigation between two parties. It's when you ask the court to declare the applicable principles to a problem. But of course, that authoritative declaration is binding, even if it's not solving a specific dispute between two states. And it did become a very important means of changing the framing of negotiations. When you move from unilateral voluntary commitments to legally binding obligations, and it can also pave the way for contentious cases, for making claims actually against specific states. So here's the International Court of Justice, the Peace Palace that I mentioned. And in order to get to the International Court of Justice for an advisory opinion, the UN General Assembly or another UN organ has to adopt a resolution. And that's a political process. You need to get a majority vote among the 192 UN member states. So this is a very cumbersome and complex process requiring quite a lot of effort. But there was another procedure to get before another tribunal, which was overlooked, which is ITLOS, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea in Hamburg, Germany, which was established under the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is the Constitution of the Oceans. <clears throat> now, ITLOS provided for jurisdiction where there was an international agreement referring um, a request to the tribunal. Um, so this is where the idea was born of concluding an international agreement among small island states, which would allow them to bypass the UN General Assembly and all the politics and simply to get before the tribunal 
without all of these obstacles. I don't need to bother you with all this stuff. So here's the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, part 12 of which has a general obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment. And yes, in 1982, climate change was not yet an idea, which we were aware of. It was probably more uh, uh, oil pollution, or oil spills, or the dumping of toxic waste, which was an issue. But the principle is, as you see from this case here, the South China Sea arbitration, that there is a positive obligation to take, take active measures to protect and preserve the marine environment. So this is a very exacting obligation. You cannot be passive towards pollution of the marine environment. You must take active measures. And when you apply that to the impact which greenhouse gas emissions have on the oceans, as I will explain now, you begin to see that it's a very nice marriage, if you like, between this very pressing problem and this very strict legal regime, which the major polluters have been evading. So why the oceans? Well, here is the change in Earth's total heat content. And you see that the overwhelming majority of temperature rise has been absorbed by the oceans. The oceans are by far the biggest uh, carbon sink they've absorbed, as we will see shortly, compared to land, atmosphere, and ice heating. This is the temperature rise in the oceans. And of course, the oceans uh, are central to the climate system. Some of you may know about this conveyor belt, which carries warm currents from the tropics to the poles and then cold water back from the poles. And it's this conveyor belt which creates this incredibly delicate balance. I was speaking to an oceanographer whose life has been to study these currents. And you realize um, how truly miraculous our existence is in the universe. <laughs> that, you know, it, it's, it's uh, what is the story of the um, Goldilocks, right? The Goldilocks zone. Uh, that, it, it, you know, the combination of uh, uh, temperature and oxygen and, you know, many other ingredients, it's just right, just right to allow human life in this uh, infinite universe, something we've taken for granted, but now we're beginning to realize that the earth and the universe can go on without us if we don't behave. Here, you see that 93% of heat is absorbed by the ocean. And here you have yet some other charts just to show you the dramatic rise from 1960 to 2015 in this particular case. And that chart has just continued to go up. Last year was the hottest, well, this summer was the hottest summer on record. So every year we're breaking a record. Uh, as, as an example, the waters off the coast of Bahamas were 38 degrees Celsius this summer, up from 30 degrees. And of course, there are a number of consequences. One of those is coral bleaching. Coral reefs, which are one of the richest uh, uh, ecosystems, marine ecosystems, uh, are very sensitive to temperature rise. So a lot of them are bleached and then they die. And with that, the whole ecosystem, including populations of fish and all the other uh, marine uh, uh, mammals and what have you also uh, perish, in addition to the problem of acidification, deoxygenation, uh, 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 extreme weather events, and all the other things that I've mentioned earlier. Here's yet another chart showing the rise in uh, ocean temperatures. So here is where the idea was born to find two countries that would conclude an agreement um, which would then be open to other states. If you were to negotiate a multilateral treaty, it would probably take you 10 years, and it would probably uh, not be very uh, uh, efficient or, 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 or adequate. So we decided that we're just going to conclude a bilateral agreement and then open it for other states to join, which would then transform it into a multilateral agreement. As we like to say in negotiations, you go in wanting a horse, you come up with a camel. Negotiations are always very complex, unpredictable. So the prime ministers of Antigua and Barbuda and Tuvalu were committed to uh, this idea of uh, this turn towards international law and advisory opinions. So they concluded this agreement, and the agreement was open to other AOC states 
to, to join. So now I'm going to tell you a bit about how that agreement came about. So here is, this is actually from CBC Power and Politics, which miraculously actually covered the signature of the agreement. <laughs> That's Antigua and Barbuda in the Caribbean and Tuvalu in the Pacific, in opposite sides of the world. Um, and uh, Tuvalu, of course, is an indigenous nation, uh, and that uh, affects their sensibilities as well about environmental issues. So here is Tuvalu, and this explains perhaps why Tuvalu is so vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And what you see there in the middle is the runway, which basically covers half of the country. And uh, because there's so little land, the, there is a, a small airplane, that propeller plane that flies from Fiji three times a week to Tuvalu. So when it's not flying, the children use this as a playground. Mm -hmm. And then there's a siren when the airplane is coming and yeah. you just have to get off the runway really quickly. So you begin to see why sea level rise would be absolutely catastrophic. And of course, the Tuvaluans are indigenous people for whom their, their ancestral territories are inextricable from their uh, spiritual uh, uh, and cultural identity. So for them, it's really mourning the loss of their the mother, <laughs> which has given them life. Here we have Simon Kofi, the foreign minister of Tuvalu, who appeared during the pandemic at COP26 via Zoom. And you can see he's making a not so subtle point. Mm -hmm. He is standing where there used to be homes. Mm -hmm. And he is telling COP26, we are drowning. Wake up. What's going to happen to us will happen to you tomorrow. Here is Barbuda. Uh, in the Caribbean after Hurricane Irma in 2017, which basically destroyed the entire island. The entire island had to be evacuated. And these extreme weather events are becoming more intense and more frequent as a result of these uh, uh, temperature rises, um, which of course change the currents, which in turn result in uh, more and more destructive hurricanes and cyclones and, and what have you. And at some point, these islands will become uninhabitable. Uh, even those islands that are not going to go under the sea, if every time you rebuild, the island is destroyed and you have to spend 30% of your gross national product to uh, rebuild, and then you sink more and more into debt, you, you begin to see the vicious cycle and where that's going to lead. So we decided that the signature would happen at COP26 on the first day um, on October 31st. And it was a secret. No one knew it was going to happen. And the prime minister of Antigua and Tuvalu were prepared to come, except that first someone had to cut out their flags. And this is one of the high points of my international law career. Because for the signature ceremony, I asked them, do you have flags? I said, mm, no, we don't have any flags. So I did what any self-respecting scholar would do. I went to Google Images and I printed those flags. And here you see the incredible, masterful way which I'm cutting them. And uh, of course, what you see to the side are restaurant menu holders, which are borrowed from the restaurant. And there you go. Without this, no progress in international law. And you see here the flags. Never mind signature about the flags. So this is the Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Natano of Tuvalu, Prime Minister Brown of Antigua and Barbuda, who signed the agreement at the ceremony and it then became uh, public. Now, this is the agreement. You don't need to, you don't need to memorize all of it just now. You see your signatures. It was duly deposited with the Secretary General of the United Nations and it was recognized as a binding international agreement. And it empowered the newly created Commission of Small Island States on Climate Change and International Law, among other things, to request an advisory opinion from the Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. So here is the press conference um, at COP26, where the signature was announced. And it was astonishing, as I will show you later, that we got coverage from every major media outlet in the world, that this simple act <laughs> generated this much interest. And many said it's the only good thing to come out of COP26. Maybe I shouldn't be that unkind, but some people said that at least. 
So here we had the president of Palau became the third state to join. Palau is in the North Pacific. So the president decided, why not? Uh, I'm going to join. And here you see uh, the signature. And in the back, you see the polar bears with life jackets, which was a, a creation of a Taiwanese artist uh, at uh, COP26 for polar bears. And here we have the logo. You cannot have an international organization without a logo. <laughs> so now we have this organization. And then the question is, now what? We have no budget, no staff. We have three members. And um, we also have two parallel proceedings. One is the campaign to go before the International Court of Justice through the UN General Assembly. And now we have this other procedure and how will these forces come together. And here is the press coverage, as I mentioned, Le Monde, New York Times, Washington Post. Everyone took an incredible interest uh, for some reason or other in this initiative, and perhaps exactly because it was thinking outside the box. It was opening a new front in the struggle against climate change. Here is the committee of uh, legal experts that I uh, assembled. And they were from around the, the world, some very notable scholars and practitioners who agreed to assist on a pro bono basis. And every year I've doubled their salary from <laughs> zero to zero. I'm a great boss. And of course, having no resources for public relations, we created a Twitter account <laughs> and we engage in Twitter diplomacy. And in fact, the Twitter account became a very important means of communicating, among other things, with the Republic of Vanuatu, which was a key player given their leadership role in respect of the UN General Assembly. So um, yeah, I learned the art of Twitter diplomacy, not <laughs> like President Trump, but slightly different context. Our fourth member was Nui, an island in the South Pacific with a population of 1,500. Not a UN member, but a member of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. So there were all these small countries that even I, as a geography fanatic, had really never heard about. I can now identify all of their flags. I would beat anyone hands down in a contest identifying flags of obscure countries. <laughs> Next meeting was COP27, Sharm al Sheikh, Egypt. And this is where some very significant developments took place a year later as the Committee of Legal Experts was preparing this dossier to come before the tribunal, but we needed more a more representative intergovernmental organization. We needed more parties. And Vanuatu was absolutely crucial um, because uh, we wanted to create a kind of coordinated strategy between these two courts, uh, given their differing areas of specialization so that it would be mutually reinforcing. So here you had what were then the three members, um, President of Palau, Prime Minister of Antigua, Prime Minister of Tuvalu. But here is the President of Vanuatu and in the lounge, the VVIP lounge, as it's called at COP27, many deals were made, conversations were made, and eventually this persuaded Vanuatu to join, which really was a game changer in terms of the fortunes of this organization. So in December of 2022, just before we made this historic first request from an international tribunal, Vanuatu joined, followed by St. Lucia, and that uh, increased our numbers to six, yes, six states. And this was the request that was made um, to the tribunal. And the question basically was, what are the obligations of states? Uh, to protect the marine environment against the deleterious consequences of greenhouse gas emissions. A very obvious question, in fact, and perhaps the, the power of this case is that it's not complicated. It's really straightforward. If you accept that greenhouse gas emissions are pollution, then all of the obligations to protect the marine environment are triggered. And some would say, oh, yes, but that was supposed to be about oil spills and not greenhouse gas emissions. Well, too bad. The law is a living tree and it grows and it evolves. So here we have on 12 December, on the website of the Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, uh, the registration 
of this historic request for an advisory opinion. And here you have just the documents, which are the order of the court ordering all states parties to make written statements if they wish to participate, including international organizations. So altogether, 50 states and organizations participate in the proceedings. Uh, they ranged, uh, other than small island states, countries like um, Canada, the United States is not a party to the Law of the Sea Convention. But what was interesting is that in addition to Bangladesh and Sierra Leone and Mozambique and Chile and Argentina, countries like Saudi Arabia, China, India, they also participated, which shows that they care. It matters for them what international law has to say, because even though we don't really have you know, world government to impose international law, international law has this very important power, power of legitimacy. It has a, mm -hmm. uh, a, 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 how do you say, a persuasive and semantic force. So it's always a good sign when the states that are not necessarily friendly to your cause still show up because they know that if they're not part of the deliberations, then they will lose an opportunity to shape the law in the direction that they wanted to go. So uh, in addition, uh, we had the African Union, the European Union, the United Nations, the UN Environment Program, so very, very extensive participation. And then three months later, with the momentum generated by this first request, which kind of put the issue on the map, the UN General Assembly adopted the resolution, which most thought would never happen, requesting an advisory opinion also from the International mm -hmm. Court of Justice by consensus, which is quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. it, it was not necessary to vote because it was adopted by consensus. Mm -hmm. But of course, the risk is that when the major polluters agree to something, you have to be a bit cautious because perhaps mm -hmm. they're trying to hijack the whole thing. And as we like to say in our legal team, the devil is in the detail. It's easy at the abstract level to say, yes, the polluter pays, yes, protection of the environment, yes, transboundary harm, but no one wants to put a number on it. But when you say that limiting temperature rise to 1.5 degrees is a legally binding obligation individually and collectively, then you begin to create the basis for attribution of liability to states and for raising the issue of loss and damages, something which nobody wants to talk about. If you come and dump toxic waste off of my coast, you must pay to clean it up. So what's the difference between that and greenhouse gas emissions, which will result in the extinction of, of our islands? So shortly after that, St. Kitts and Nevis and St. Vincent and the Grenadines became the seventh and eighth members, and then the Bahamas. So today we have nine members, and it was with nine members, which was quite a good sort of critical Assembly. mass. I'm sorry? Assembly. Exactly, there we go. That we um, appeared uh, at the hearing, which was held in September before the Law of the Sea Tribunal. So I'm gonna go quickly through this and try to wrap up. This was our submission, uh, some 200 page submission with uh, two scientific experts who had contributed to the work of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the most authoritative source of science. It's irrefutable science. We did not have to debate the science, and that was another part of the power of the simplicity of this case. The science is 1.5 degrees. We all know that. The question is, what are the obligations of states in order to achieve that target? Um, this is the uh, International Court of Justice, which also authorized the Commission of Small Island States to intervene as an intergovernmental organization. And um, it is an interesting idea to create an intergovernmental organization in cyberspace. If someone wants to ask, what is your postal address? I would not be able to answer that question. Um, and the written statements were filed by June. And then uh, uh, ultimately, the hearing was held from 11 to 25 September. So it was a two week period because there were so many states that wished to participate. And these are the four polar bears. So I'm going to now to end 
this um, presentation. I'm sorry for having gone on for too long. Just playing with you a little video that was uh, created for us, which will give you a nice four or five minute synopsis of what happened at those hearings. And then I will stop and you don't have to listen to me anymore. Um, uh, how do I? You're going to? Okay, there we go. Yesterday, we have uh, signed the, an historic accord uh, to establish a commission. The commission was made operational yesterday, and it is actually designed to change the conversation from one of vague voluntary commitments to uh, legally binding obligations and compensation. The International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea is now in session. L'audience du Tribunal International du Droit de la Mer est ouverte. At its third meeting on 26 August 2022, the Commission of Small Island States on Climate Change and International Law decided to request an advisory opinion from the Tribunal. For almost 30 years, Small island states have been arguing about the impact of uh, climate change and there's been little response and that is what has actually forced us now to have this complementary pathway, this legal pathway in order to accelerate the climate uh, diplomacy that is taking place with these various cops. In my time, I've seen, you know, beaches have started to disappear completely. I'm seeing that the coastline in Antigua looks different than it did when I was a kid, and that was only about 10 years ago. So give it 20 more years or 30 more years, you know, what's, what's going to happen? So I, I'm also a mother to a one-year-old daughter of the Pacific. I'm hopeful that she will be able to return to her ancestral homeland and know that she still has a place there and that it still exists for her to, to enjoy. And at the same time, I'm worried that it may not be there anymore for her. 1982, UN recognized the Convention of the Law of the Sea and the importance of this trial so that people are aware of their obligations. Life is complicated and it involves difficult choices. We're all familiar with the propensity of governments to explain that their past promises cannot be fulfilled because of unforeseen developments or the need to balance competing demands or to pursue more urgent or important objectives. That is the nature of politics. But we are not politicians. The duty of the lawyer is to say honestly and plainly what the law is. in their mandate is to address a fundamental inequity. And that fundamental inequity is that this group of specially affected countries, these small island states, contribute minimal levels of GHG emissions. They're contributing minuscule amounts to the problem, and yet they are experiencing the most cataclysmic, catastrophic, and even existential harm. The world is in the middle of an unprecedented revolution, and that's the only way one can describe it. And that revolution is among the grassroots, it's from the bottom up. And those who have traditionally been on the margins of power are rising up, they're uniting, and they're making their voices heard. We hope that this, this decision will be a landmark which other tribunals will follow, and so that the, the obligations, moral obligations, but expressing the legal obligations will follow from that too. Either 
a unified humankind does what is necessary now to address climate change, or it will be forced to do so after unimaginable catastrophes leave no other choice.